There are many who say that this bill is abortion on demand. I submit that it is not. I submit that we have abortion on demand in the state of New York right now. Any woman that wants an abortion can get one. And the real difference is how much money she has to spend. If she has $25, she has it done here under the most abominable circumstances. If she has more money, she can go abroad. But the fact remains that she can get it. We have abortion on demand. And if she doesn't have the $25, please don't forget that she can abort herself. And regretfully, regretfully, this is happening more often than you or I like to admit. Lawrence later had been coordinating repeal efforts throughout the nation. He now focused all of his attention on New York. The last few days before the vote was called on the abortion rights bill in 1970 were frantic days. All of us were up in Albany lobbying. It looked very close down to the last minute. It is my hope that we will defeat this bill so unhumane and so unchristian. We have not had a day in this session of the legislature any more important than today, and it is my firm hope that we defeat this measure today. I, as a woman, feel that I can speak with some feeling that perhaps only the other women in this chamber can, and that is the strong maternal drive that people have, and that it is only the anguish that leads them to these desperate situations, sir. You and mentioned I believe, the question, Ms. Krupsack, of when does life begin? Can you Mr. answer Terry, that question? Mr. Terry, for me, life begins at the moment of conception, but Thank I am you. here as a legislator, and I must represent and give, I have an obligation to give a hearing and recognition to the fact that that is not the same view of all people under all circumstances. In the last 10 years, 367 young women in New York City were known to have died as a result of an abortion or an attempted one, either self-inflicted or performed by an unqualified person and under unsafe circumstances. Isn't that the ultimate morality? Could we have saved 367 young women from dying if we had not imposed upon them our sense of morality and condemn them, and I insist on using the word condemned, to the butchery of the side streets of Harlem, or the Riverside Drive in my district. The final roll call showed a tie. As the Speaker of the House raised his gavel to announce the bill's defeat, George Michaels asked for the floor. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Michaels. Assemblyman George Michaels represented a predominantly Roman Catholic district. His constituents expected him to vote against the bill, which he did. I had hoped that this would never come to pass. I fully appreciate that this is the termination of my political career. But Mr. Speaker, what's the use of getting elected or re-elected if you don't stand for something. I cannot, in good conscience, stand here and be the vote that defeats this bill. I therefore request you, Mr. Speaker, to change my negative vote to an affirmative vote. George Michael's vote did end his political career, but for thousands of women who lived in New York and for those who could afford to travel there, abortion was now legal. The day after the bill became law, New York's Planned Parenthood was ready to respond. Phones lined up on tables, it was like a telethon. Every one of those phones had five lines on it 
and every single button was lit. And we each went to our station and picked up the phone. And you couldn't listen, you know, without your heart aching for every single one. And just being so grateful that you could say for the first time in history, yes, now I'm going to give you a phone number to call and we'll set up an appointment and it was all going to be clean and safe. The New York law was an inspiration to Dr. Hodgson, who decided to take on her state's law once again. It seemed to me that I was naive, of course, but the only thing that was necessary to do was to find a, a perfect test case that the public could condone and would see the reason why, and that would Minnesota then would change their law. I thought it would be that easy. An opportunity to act came when a pregnant patient contracted German measles. Knowing the risks of congenital deformity, she asked Dr. Hodgson to perform an abortion. I suggested uh, sending her to Mexico, we were, or referring her to the clergy counseling service is what we were doing then. And she said, no, I want you to do it, and uh, I think I have that right. Dr. Hodgson asked the courts to let her perform an abortion on Nancy Widmeyer, but they took too long. On April 29th, Dr. Hodgson went ahead without them. The federal judges were not particularly sympathetic, so I was indicted and, and the trial and all followed. The first day of court, the prosecution calls witnesses to show Dr. Hodgson performed the abortion. The defense doesn't dispute it. Instead, they begin to argue that the law interferes with individual privacy. It is Friday afternoon and the end of this trial. Judge Jerome Plunkett finds Dr. Hodson guilty and refuses to submit the case to the Minnesota Supreme Court. The question is, when courts will agree abortion is something to be decided by a doctor and a patient. Arrests elsewhere throughout the country continued. In Chicago, Rabbi Tickton discovered that one of the women who had come to him for an abortion referral was a plainclothes police officer. And I called back home and was told by Esther, my wife, that, that there was a warrant out for my arrest. I was really quite shocked by that. I didn't think it would ever come to that. Because everybody understood that sooner or later, the legislation would have to change. Chicago police were on alert. The Janes continued their work, and in 1972, police raided one of the apartments where they were doing abortions. We believed that if a law was wrong, that we had some responsibility to stand up and say, this is a wrong law. Not only was there the need, but there was a philosophical obligation on our part, on somebody's part, to, to, to disrespect a law that disrespected women. Around the country, the abortion controversy had escalated. New laws were being enacted while others were being rescinded. In New York, opponents had tried to overturn the law, but failed. They were now trying to place restrictions on it. New York's district attorney went to Reverend Moody to lay out his concerns. One of the things that he said to me was, what we want to do is to write into the law uh, a prerequisite that a woman has to go to a clergy for counseling before they can have an abortion. Uh, clergy or social worker or combination thereof and so forth. And uh, I said, no way, Mr. District Attorney, are you going to get clergy to do that? You're not going to get this clergy to do it, I'll tell you now. The woman doesn't need to come to clergy. If a woman wants to come to clergy because she has a moral or theological or problem, she can do that. It's always open. But to force her to come to it is to somehow impute to that woman that she doesn't have the, either she's doing something immoral, she doesn't have the ability to make her own decision, or whatever. Uh, and that would be wrong. 